the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you to our Perseverance Family Conversation, and as always, it's great to be with all of you in this second Sunday in the season of Lent. How good it is to be with all of you. And we like to start off our conversation always by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. Also, every time we pray the Hail Holy Queen, we invoke Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's pray the prayer that Mary loves most, and that prayer is the Hail Mary. We place this day, this week, this Lent, in the hands of Mary, as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now let's invite our spiritual director to be with us. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. What a blessing it is to have the Holy Spirit as our guide. Holy Spirit is known as the paraclete. Holy Spirit is also known as the gift of gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our souls. The Holy Spirit is also known as our, con our counselor. He who gives us good advice is also known as our consoler. Holy Spirit is also known as our interior master. St. Paul points out that we really don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's humbly ask the Holy Spirit to come to be with us so as to enlighten our minds, enlighten our minds and to strengthen our wills in the love for God. And let's pray the classical prayer to the Holy Spirit. That prayer is, Come Holy Spirit, Fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, Grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.
Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation on this second Sunday in the holy season of Lent. And as always, we start off by praying with each other. And then to encourage all of you, I will be praying for you in my Mass today. I'd like to place you all on the altar in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The holy sacrifice of the Mass is the greatest of all prayers. It's the prayer par excellence that unites heaven and earth. So I'd like to place you on the altar and offer these following intentions. The first, I'd like to pray that as we enter into this new week, that all of us would make a concerted effort to try to try to try to be open to the Holy Spirit. In a word. Our sanctification depends in large part upon being docile to the Holy Spirit. Being docile to the Holy Spirit. We can possibly pray this prayer. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My second intention, I'd like to pray for your families placing your families on the altar in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And I'd like to pray, especially for your family members that who, who have walked away from God, that are seeking their pleasure and happiness in false gods. I'd like to pray for them. And finally, I'd like to pray in a special way for uh, the conversion of sinners, but I'd like to pray especially for especially for the conversion of deathbed sinners. That's right, the conversion of deathbed sinners, sinners that will be dying sometime within the next 24 hours, that they will be saved. that they will be saved through our prayers. Our Lord himself said, What does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and loses his soul? There's nothing more important in our lives than to arrive at our eternal goal, which is heaven. So those are the intentions I'd like to place on the altar as we enter into this second Sunday of Lent.
So, we're in Lent. Ash Wednesday, we read through the gospel in which our Lord sets the, he sets the, the program for us to be able to live out Lent fruitfully. In the gospel for Ash Wednesday, in which our Lord offers to us three different practices that we should try to be implementing in this holy season of Lent. And that would be the importance of prayer and penance and almsgiving. I mentioned you the th three dimensional way of understanding this to, to go up, to go in, and to go out. That's right, to go up through prayer, to go in through penance, and to go out through almsgiving or charity. Last Sunday, first Sunday of Lent, we contemplated Jesus in the desert where our Lord is the model for us in the desert our Lord is present for 40 days and 40 nights in the silence of the de desert while there our Lord is praying fervently he's fasting And after 40 days and 40 nights, the devil comes to tempt him. One of the first temptations that the devil approaches Jesus with is, he says, if you're really the son of God, then why don't you tell those stones to be turned into bread? knowing that Jesus was hungry. And Jesus said to the devil, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So my friends, in our spiritual battle, where we have to confront the devil, the flesh, and the world, the three principal enemies of our spiritual life. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ teaches us the tools that we have to utilize, the spiritual weapons that we have to utilize so that we can win that battle. They are prayer and penance and also the word of God. The devil comes to Jesus by tempting him by using the word of God, but Jesus uses the word of God to defeat the devil. So this season of Lent is also good practice for us to read and to meditate upon the word of God. And what I like to do in my, my daily lecture with all of you is I like to take the Word of God, like to summarize it in my own words, and then I like to give you an interpretation, and then finally, after the interpretation, I like to give you a practical application. So, summary, interpretation, and application. Summary, interpretation, and application. So, that's uh, the style that we're using, the method we're using to try to 
expound for you the, the Word of God and how to understand it. The Second Vatican Council has pointed out that every time we go to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, we are nourished at two tables. The table of the Word of God and the table of the Body and Blood of Christ. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, we say, give us this day our daily bread. What are we asking for? We're asking the Lord that he'll give us health so that we can work hard to provide for our family, food, clothing, and shelter. But also we're praying for the bread for our mind. And the bread for our mind is the Word of God, the Bible. Jesus said to Satan, Man does not live on bread alone, but every word that issues forth from the mouth of God. And then we have the bread of life. And then we have the bread of life. Which is the Eucharist. So now we're going to enter, my friends, into the infinite treasures and riches of the Word of God. Today we've got Sunday, we have three readings from the Old Testament, the first book of the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, Psalm 33. Then we have a short reading from the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Then given that we're in year A, we're reading through the Gospel of Matthew, we have Matthew 17, 1 to 9, and we have the account of the transfiguration. So there we have our, our spiritual nourishment for today. So let's enter into the book of Genesis, and I'd just like to summarize it for you and uh, give you, pull out one idea to uh, to explain. Okay, today we have the person of Abram. The person of Abram, and God tells him to get up and to leave his native land and his kinsfolk. And to go to a land that God would show to him. Then the next few verses, God says that he'll make him a great nation and he will bless, he will bless him. So I'd like to pull out three ideas for you. The name. Abram his name will be changed to Abraham. How important it is the name, the name of the person. For example, last Friday I was teaching a confirmation class And it surfaced the whole idea of the saints. And I asked, I've got about 30, about 30, 30 to 35 uh, students that I'm teaching on Friday. And I asked them, well, what is the name of the saint that you've chosen for your confirmation? 
And two of the girls said that they had chosen St. Joan of Arc. St. Joan of Arc. Over the years, I've done many baptisms. They say over the past 15 years, I'm noticing a fad that many of the names that they're giving their children are kind of weird names. Very weird names. Names that I think that the parents have actually created new names. It's a fad. And fads come and go. But it's not... It's a fad that's not according to what the church has always taught. To what the church has always taught. Right now on my screen, I see various names. Martha, Maria, Marie, Francis, Martha, Stella, Michael. Your parents gave to you good good names because the name that we bear we will have the rest of our lives for example we've got martha martha which is a a biblical name sophia which means wisdom one of the gifts of the holy spirit Francis could be Francis of Assisi or Francis de Sales. Marie would be the French for Mary. Michael would be Saint Michael the Archangel. All those are, are names of saints. And by having a name of a saint, then you have that patron saint that's going to be praying for you. You have a patron saint that will be praying for you. The Beatles would sing, get a little help from my friends. Well, we can interpret that in a spiritual way. We want to get a little help from our friends, and our friends are the saints. So we should get to know the lives of the saints and try to imitate their virtue and ask for their, their intercession. So that's the first point I'd like to make from the first reading. He's Abram, his name will be changed from Abram to Abraham, and he'll be a very key figure in the Bible, the first of the patriarchs. Sophie says that her patron saint is St. Therese. What a great saint she is. So we should get to know our saints, get to know who they are, to uh, read the lives of the saints and try to imitate their virtue. So Abram gets up and he's called by God to leave his country. Just a short interpretation of that is that we should be willing, my friends, we should be willing, we should be willing to go wherever God wants to send us. I repeat, we should be willing to go wherever God wants to send us. And it's not so much where we are, but with whom we are. No matter where we go, we can be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because God is everywhere. The next point I'd like to make is that God tells Abraham to leave. And he says, I will bless you. Let's talk about that. 
I will bless you. If you read through the Catechism of the Catholic Church, they speak about different sacramentals. There are seven sacraments, but there are many sacramentals. And we can use the sacrament to help us to draw closer to God. What would be a sacramental? A cross, a rosary, a crucifix, statue of Mary. Uh, or would be uh, a blessing. So blessing is a sacramental. Blessing would be a sacramental. Blessings. You as parents, many of your parents should bless your children. It's a very good habit for parents to bless their children every night before they go to bed. And you as parents should have holy water. You should have holy water in your homes by which you can be blessing your children. Also, blessing. You should have your homes blessed by a priest or a deacon. Especially if you're moving from one home to another, you should have your new residence blessed. And it would be a good idea to enthrone the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. When you buy a religious object, you should have that blessed by the priest. A rosary, a crucifix, whatever it might be. To have it blessed by a priest. And then we as priests, we end up by blessing people at the end of the Mass. Last but not least, we're talking about God blessed Abraham and how we can apply this to our lives is we should start off our prayer every day by blessing ourselves, by making the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We should make that sign of the cross with great reverence. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. So we start off our prayer by blessing ourselves. Last week I I said the uh, the first communion mass for the the children on Wednesday and I taught them how to make the sign of the cross but also the meaning of the sign of the cross. We all make the sign of the cross. But perhaps we don't really understand the meaning behind it. So I'll explain it briefly. You make the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. First of all, you're professing the greatest mystery in the Catholic faith. That mystery is the mystery of the Blessed Trinity. That we believe in one God and three persons the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The second would be, we are, by making the sign of the cross, by making the sign of the cross, we are also we are also Professing our thanks and belief that Jesus saved us by the Holy Cross. So let's get in the habit of blessing our children, blessing our family, receiving the blessing of the priest, having our homes blessed, 
and also by reverently starting off our prayer our prayers by making the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son the Holy Spirit amen so those are three ideas I'd like to just glean from the first reading the importance of the name the importance of going wherever God wants us to go but always always being with God and lastly the importance of blessing Let's move into the Responsorial Psalm. Lord, let your mercy be on us as we place our trust in you. Two words that jump out at me. Mercy. Mercy. A suggestion for Lent. I would strongly encourage all of us, speaking about mercy, to read this text. It's the Diary of Divine Mercy in My Soul, St. Maria Faustina Kowalska. There's ever a book that explains really what mercy is I don't think there's any spiritual classic better than this better than this divine mercy in my soul last night I watched a very short movie on the life of Saint Faustina it was a very short movie and they pulled out about five different five different scenes in her life. One of the scenes was that Saint Faustina was in her cell and Jesus spoke to her and said, You do not want this man to die without receiving my mercy. And Jesus said this to her and then she she was transported from her cell to the bedside of this man that was dying. And Jesus told St. Faustina to pull out her rosary and to pray the chaplet of divine mercy. She prayed the chaplet of divine mercy and this man that was dying would not give lived a very good life. He repented and he gave himself to trusting in God's mercy. So that's just one idea I'd like to pull, glean from the psalm, is mercy. We really want to understand mercy, to read the diary of St. Faustina. And if we want to receive mercy, if we want to receive mercy, then we should try to give mercy to others. Jesus himself said, he said, be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Also we pray in the Our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Then the next word that touched me is trust. And I see there's a relationship between mercy and trust. When Jesus told St. Faustine that to have the divine mercy image painted, and here we have a, a depiction of it, the divine mercy image painted, he said that he wanted to, be, to have painted below those words, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. What he said was the greatest of all sins is not trusting in him. We all at times are, tempt are, are tempted to doubt. That's part of, part of living. But every time we're tempted to doubt, 
I think it's a good idea to look at the image of divine mercy and to say five times, Jesus, I trust in you. 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 To do the agite contra, to do the opposite, when we're tempted to doubt, to reaffirm our trust and our confidence in Christ. All right, my friends, let's move then from the responsorial psalm, Psalm 33, to the second reading of the Mass. Second reading of the Mass is taken from the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy. And I'd like to pull out one or two ideas in which Paul says to Timothy and to us, Beloved, bear your share of hardship for the gospel with the strength that comes from God. Bear your share of the hardship of the gospel. All right. My comment, my, my commentary on that is the following. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's our master. He's our teacher. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's our teacher, and he's our master. And he carried the cross. Jesus carried the cross. All of us, my friends, we all have our own cross to carry. I have my cross and you have your cross to carry. That's our hardship. We all have a, our cross to carry. We all have our our hardships. Now I'd like to give you a suggestion for you as well as for myself. Do not carry your cross by yourself. It's too heavy. Do not carry your cross by yourself. It's just too heavy. But rather, I'd like to give you a biblical cross to really encourage all of us in the carrying of our, our daily cross. It's Matthew chapter 11, 28 to 30. This verse that I'm going to be quoting from memory is the means by which we can carry our cross better. Because either the cross can make us better or bitter, it can sanctify us or it can crush us. Listen to the words of Christ. He says, Come to me, all of you who are weary. Find life burdensome. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because my my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That biblical passage seems to be somewhat contradictory, but it really is not. 
Because when you think about a yoke, what is a yoke? A yoke would be like it's an apparatus that's placed on the shoulders of an ox or oxen to help to till the ground. Farmers, especially farmers in the past, understood that very well. And really the nature of the yoke, it's, it's both heavy and it's cumbersome. So in certain it seems to be almost contradictory. But what Jesus is saying is when you're carrying your cross, if you carry it by yourself, it's heavy, it's burdensome, and cumbersome too at that. However, if we share our cross with Christ, if we share our cross with Christ, then he makes the cross lighter. So, my friends, whatever your cross might be, a physical ailment, a family problem, economic struggle, struggles, emotional turmoil, difficulty at work, difficulty with a neighbor, dryness in prayer, whatever it might be. Do not carry that cross by yourself because if you try to carry the cross by yourself, it's too heavy. And one last idea on to share, take our share of the hardship and to carry our own cross. This is very good for Lent. We mentioned the three practices of prayer and fasting and penance. Go up, go in, go out. This is related to the going out of almsgiving. Let us try during these days of Lent to be a good Samaritan to others and to imitate Simon of Cyrene. Those two figures represent a very noble interior disposition that we should try to cultivate always, but especially in the holy season of Lent. Meaning, like Simon the Cyrene and like the Good Samaritan, when we see someone that is suffering. Let's help that person. We see someone that's depressed. Let's try to encourage that person. When we see a person carrying a heavy cross, let's not add to the cross, but be willing to be like Simon of Cyrene and to help that person to carry the cross. I think one of the most touching scenes in the movie of Mel Gibson, The Passion of the Christ, is when Simon of Cyrene overcomes his initial resistance, in which at first he didn't want to help our Lord to carry the cross. But once he overcomes the initial resistance, he helps our Lord to carry the cross. And the resistance turns into joy in helping our Lord carry the cross. And there's a scene where you see the arms that are intertwined. The arm of Simon is wrapped around the arm of Christ. And I like that. I want to walk and carry my cross with Christ and have my arm intertwined with the arm of Christ as I carry my cross on a daily basis.
And lastly, I'd like to just take one one more word from the second reading in which Paul speaks about grace bestowed on us in Christ Jesus before time began. I once heard an acronym that was given by a Protestant pastor on grace. G-R-A-C-E. The pastor said, what is grace? It's God's riches at Christ's expense. I like that. Grace would be God's riches at Christ's expense. Let us try, let us try in this holy season of Lent to grow in God's grace. Turning to Mary, the full of grace. However, if we really want to skyrocket in grace, We really want to skyrocket, to really go up like a rocket in grace. The best way to grow in grace is to receive Holy Communion in the state of grace with great love. By doing that, we can surmount, we can arrive at the apex in the spiritual life by frequent fervent and faith-filled Holy Communions. Grace. <clears throat> Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. So my friend, let's move now to the the gospel for today. And the gospel for today, my friends, is the gospel of the transfiguration. Taken from St. Matthew chapter 17, verse 1 through 9. About 20 years ago, Pope John Paul II, he wrote a pastoral letter in honor of Mary with the title, The Blessed Virgin Mary and the Rosary. The Blessed Virgin Mary and the Rosary. The Blessed Virgin Mary and the Rosary. In that, John Paul II introduced a new series in the Most Holy Rosary, and that would be the Luminous Mysteries, the Baptism of Christ, the Wedding Feast of Cana, the Proclamation of the Kingdom, the Transfiguration, in the institution of the Most Holy Eucharist. Those are the five mysteries of life in the Luminous Mysteries. John Paul II said that the mystery of light par excellence is the gospel today. And that is the mystery of the transfiguration. The mystery of light par excellence. There's so much that can be said about this gospel and this mystery, so much. I invite you as you read and meditate upon this gospel today to beg the Holy Spirit, beg the Holy Spirit to give you light to understand what is this, this fourth luminous mystery, the second Sunday of Lent, 
the transfiguration, what does it really mean to you? There's so much. I'll give you a couple of ideas to whet your appetite. Number one is that Jesus could have climbed that mountain by himself. Mount Tabor, the Mount of the Transfiguration, he could have climbed by himself. But no. Rather, he wanted to climb the mountain. He wanted to climb the mountain of the Transfiguration with three of the apostles. And they are Peter, James, and John. These were the chosen friends of Christ. And we could say this. These were the chosen friends of Christ, and these were his three best friends. As Jesus chose Peter, James, and John to be his best friends, also Jesus wants you to be his best friend. Now, I can give you another suggestion for this holy season of Lent to cultivate a deeper friendship with Christ. And that would be the following. If you don't already have it, To purchase that book, it's called Encino Jesu. If you don't already have it, I would strongly encourage you in Sino. I posted it for you. Encino Jesu. It's a book in which a Benedictine monk from Ireland has this encounter with Jesus Christ, kind of like St. Faustina Kowalska, in which he speaks to this Benedictine monk and encourage this Benedictine monk to write down these locutions, kind of like St. Faustina. And the essence of this book is what I'm pointing out is that Jesus wants to establish a deep friendship with this monk, with priests, but also with you. but also with you. And this friendship with Christ is also related to the Blessed Sacrament and the Eucharist. Jesus is truly Jesus is truly present in the Blessed Sacrament. And as Sophie has pointed out, it's when heart speaks to heart, the journal of a priest at prayer. That's the definition that Cardinal Newman actually gives to prayer. Sophie colloquy is a heart-to-heart -heart conversation between God and us. But there's no reason why you lay people cannot also read 
and meditate and glean some spiritual treasures from that wonderful book. So that's the one idea I'd like to lay lay on your heart for the transfiguration. Peter, James, and John were chosen to climb the holy mountain with the Lord, to experience and relish his friendship as they climbed the mountain. So we are also called to climb the mountain of holiness. And we are also invited to enter into a deep, dynamic friendship with Jesus Christ. In the painting of the Sacred Heart in Spanish, El Amigo Que Nunca Falla. Jesus is the friend that will never fail us. So, I'll pray for you today in my Mass. you pray for me, and I invite you to share our conversation with many of your friends, so that they, too, will experience the great friendship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.